It gives me a great pleasure to bring Danny and Mia greetings from the Technion. I feel that uh, part of my family in the Technion is somehow retiring. Um, when I was a postdoc in 1975 and I got a telephone call from the Technion, I thought that somebody was made, making a mistake. I said, me, Technion, a psychologist? And then they told me that, yeah, we open a faculty of medicine. Uh, then I found a family in the Technion, and the family came from the Faculty of Industrial Engineering and Management um, that had a behavioral component. But very few of you know that uh, the reason I'm here, one of the reasons, you can blame Danny. In fact, I know Danny from 1968. And he was my instructor in a seminar work in Tel Aviv University in the Department of Psychology. And because of the 80, 85 he gave me, I could continue to study. <laughs> Just imagine if he would give me 60, 65. Then uh, no sleep research, no president. <laughs> No dean of medicine, nothing. <laughs> so uh, Danny is partly to be uh, is partly responsible for uh, the fact that I continued my academic career <coughs> and um, joined the Technion in 1975. And ever since we had a close relationship under the um, umbrella of the Technion Center for uh, Research in Safety and Human Engineering. And I see many faces that uh, were under the same umbrella. I see Nomi, I saw Amir Zvuloni here, Dov Zohar, Hillel Pratt. Uh, this was a kind of uh, a natural resort within the Technion. And I always say it was the lowest part of the Technion. <laughs> physically speaking, <laughs> because if you pour a glass of water at the Senate building, it goes go down to the Gutfield building. And uh, this is where uh, this family of researchers that share the interest and passion in human behavior uh, conducted the research during the day and during the night. It was a good time. It was exciting. I think that uh, I at least uh, miss these times that uh, we spend very, very long hours in the laboratory, um, either watching somebody asleep or watching somebody perform a performance uh, and understanding both behaviors. So what I decided to do is to summarize two aspects of our research that started in these days. I must uh, confess that this is the first scientific talk I gave in two years. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of the uh, prices you pay when you become high on the administrative uh, hierarchy. So uh, I hope it will go well. Well, uh, plenty of sleep keeps me on the job. This is a poster that I took from the uh, US Ministry of Labor. And um, we uh, since the mid-70s, <coughs> try to understand some of the regulation of sleep and sleepiness during the day, and how these interact with performance, behavior, and uh, issues related to safety at work. Just to show you how we looked, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't find a slide with Danny. Uh, this is Dov Zohar, and uh, this nice guy with a lot of hair used to be me. <laughs> the Minister of Labor of the time, Shoshana Arbeli Almuznino, and uh, deputy. deputy, deputy. And the uh, legendary Shlomo Amir, the head of the committee that supported our research for many years, who passed away several years ago. And uh, obviously, I explained something about sleep, which was always uh, a fascinating area. This was my hero. 
This is a slide taken from National Geographic, dedicated in, in its entirety to SLIP, published about 20 years ago, and this is Nathaniel Kleitman. And uh, Nathaniel Kleitman is a very interesting uh, case study of a professor who uh, was a Jewish refugee from a pogrom in Kishinev, decided to immigrate to Palestine, and um, found himself on Alice Island. Studied uh, physiology in uh, Georgia, and found a job in the University of Chicago where he discovered REM sleep, dreaming sleep. Uh, we became friends, uh, and we spoke many times. He is the guru of sleep, modern sleep research, and uh, he believed that, in fact, sleep that is structured in a cyclic way during the night, the same structure continued in waking. During sleep, every 90 minutes, we have dreaming sleep, the black bars, alternating with deep sleep, what we call stage three, four. And he believed that this basic structure of an hour and a half cycles continue during waking as well. And uh, as a young and uh, uh, very enthused researcher, uh, I believed that this should be a very fruitful area of research. And the question was, how do you study the structure of sleepiness? When you take uh, a normal person and you isolate him from any time cues, from light dark, from social cues, uh, when I was a student in the University of Florida, we used to do it in a soundproof chamber, but some studies did uh, uh, isolation in caves. The sleep-wake cycle, sleep-wake, emerge as what we call a free-running cycle, longer than 24 hours. And this is the endogenous circadian cycle. It is not 24 hours, it's 24 point something. In recent years, we know it's very close to 24, but it, when I was a student, we believed it can be 25, 26, 27, and even longer. Once you entrain the cycle, you assume the 24 hours. But this is the sleep-wake cycle. The sleep-wake cycle is controlled by the suprachiasmatic nucleus and entrained by light, by specially uh, evolutionary developed uh, uh, track, the retinohypothalamic track, that is not the regular uh, uh, um, track that subserve vision. Now, uh, when we are exposed to the alternating day-night uh, cycle, we entrain the sleep-wake cycle. When light shines at the beginning of sleep, we delay the next day sleep cycle. When light shines at the end of sleep, we advance the cycle. So on both ends of the sleep periods, we entrain it into a 24 hours. This was known. This was uh, a subject of research in many laboratories. And when I came back to Israel, my research area was the structure of sleepiness from waking up to going to sleep. We all are aware of the everyday phenomena of the siesta zone. Many people practice it. Many people feel it by dog practice it. <laughs> and the fact that during the night, we are very sleepy. So the question is, how do you study such a phenomenon? And in order to do it, we develop a new design, experimental protocol, in which we did the following. After a normal sleep in the laboratory, from let's say 11 o'clock at night to 6.40 in the morning, we ask the subjects every 20 minutes to go to sleep for seven minutes. Seven minutes. And we did it 72 times for 24 hours. Later, Amir Zvuluni did it for 48 hours. And the study we did with Danny, we did it for 36 hours. We measure sleep during these seven minutes, sleep attempts, and this was the indication of sleep propensity, the probability of making a sleep to a wake to sleep transition. To make life more interesting, 
we introduce a sleep deprivation condition. Instead of spending the night asleep in the laboratory, we ask the subject to be awake for 24 hours, and then we start this paradigm. In order to make it even more interesting, we did introduce another condition in which they spend the night awake, and then we ask them to go to bed for seven minutes and to resist sleep. Now, this is to say, here they were paid for producing sleep. Here they were paid for producing wake. So the payment to the subject was dependent on how much sleep or how much wake they produce. Now, uh, the subjects, I must say, were standing in line to uh, participate in these studies. Each of them was allocated a room, equipped with electrodes to follow the sleep-wake cycle. And this was the paradigm that served us for at least 20 years to understand the structure of sleepiness during the day in different conditions and to ask many experimental questions. Here are the data of four subjects. Uh, this is percent of every seven minutes how much they slept. White bars is very light sleep, dotted is deeper, and this is the deepest part of sleep. And you can see during the day, after a night of sleep in the laboratory, there is very little sleep. Then sleep starts to accumulate during the evening, reaching, in this case, the peak at around 5 o'clock in the morning. So uh, interesting, again, if you look across subjects, something happened around 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. There is some accumulation of daytime sleep. These are the data of uh, seven subjects who are attempting to resist sleep after a night of sleep deprivation. And here you start to see some very interesting finding. For instance, if you take this subject, he showed a lot of sleep immediately after waking up, then waking uh, up and resisting sleep. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there is a peak in sleepiness. And then at around 8 o'clock in the afternoon, there is another decrease in sleepiness. And then suddenly, during the night, in one trial, the gate is open. And in every successive trial, is able to sleep almost the, the full seven minutes. And if you can see, this phenomena of almost all or none is very characteristic of every one of the subjects. Look at this one. One trial, and the next one immediately Every seven minutes, is able to make the transition very smoothly within seconds. But look what happened just before the gate. Before the gate, there is a period in which they can easily resist sleep. In order to look across subjects, what we did is synchronize all the subjects to the first gate. This is the resisting sleep. This is the attempting sleep. Every subject partic participated twice in this study about two weeks apart. And you can see that once the gate is open, sleep is at the six out of every seven minutes uh, range. And look how beautiful the siesta zone is, centered about seven hours before the gate, seven to eight hours before the gate is open. Just before the gate, there is a period in which subjects could either easily resist sleep or couldn't fall asleep. Remember. They accumulated sleep loss. They didn't sleep here. Then they got only partial sleep seven minutes out of 20. Nevertheless, at 8 o'clock, before the gate was open, they were unable to fall asleep. And when they were paid to resist sleep, they could easily resist sleep. This uh, led us to look into the gate as an individual trait. And these are the correlation in three different st uh, uh, studies between the gate under the attempting sleep or the resisting sleep, there is a very nice correlation. Which led us to the idea that opening the sleep gate at night is an individual trait. Now the question is, what controlled the gate? At that time, there was the hype of melatonin. I remember the, I took these slides in the US. I participated in a meeting on melatonin on the top of uh, the Rockefeller uh, Center. And uh, somebody showed me, uh, uh, this is about 20 years ago, showed me a, a, a box of melatonin and said, where did you buy it? He said, downstairs, there is a pharma. 
And I went down and I took it. It was at that time $10.99. Now it's probably $3. At that time, melatonin was considered to be a magic drug. Melatonin is secreted from the pineal gland, which is sitting here at the depth of the brain. Again, the SCN, is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, is here. And the pineal produces melatonin only during the dark period in all organisms known. In humans, in birds, in fish, in insects, even in the algae, melatonin is produced only during the night period. So the association between night and melatonin uh, suggested that melatonin may be a sleep hormone. In fact, melatonin is not a sleep hormone, it is a sex hormone. Melatonin is used by animals who are living away from the equator to regulate the reproductive cycle. High levels of melatonin during the dark period, during the winter, inhibit the gonads. Short days or short dark periods release the gonads and this synchronize uh, reproductive behavior with environmental conditions. Probably the effect of sleep is a residual one, and we decided to study the phenomena of the gate of sleep with melatonin. This was uh, one of the uh, uh, Tamar Shochat PhD project, and what we found out is that the nocturnal melatonin onset is phase locked to the primary sleep gate. Let me show you how we did it. We did the 7.13 paradigm from 7 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock the next day. Every 20 minutes, we took a sample of blood and we measured the level of melatonin. The open dots are melatonin, and you can see that before the gate is open, melatonin starts to rise about two and a half hours before the gate is open. This is one subject, this is the second subject, and the next slide showed uh, um, average data of five subjects tested three times under three different conditions, and look how clear-cut the difference or the phase locking between the onset of melatonin and opening of the gate, and this is the cross-correlation between the two phenomena. So we found out that indeed it is melatonin that opened the primary sleep gate. If it is melatonin, we assumed that light should affect the gate. And here was a project of uh, part of the PhD of Orna Sishinsky. Again, we use the same paradigm, the 713 paradigm, and we shine light at a time that should delay the gate. And you can see the gate under the bright light condition was delayed by about an hour. This is the dim light, this is the bright light. We could delay the gate. And this provides some explanation to some of the treatments that exist in practice when uh, usually there are adolescents, young adults that suffer from what we call the phase delay syndrome. They cannot go to sleep before the early uh, morning hours. You can shift their sleep gate by shining light either in the morning or in the evening. So uh, this was clear cut that the gate that is regulated by melatonin respond to light. Some other questions uh, that we tried to answer was, we know that sleep deteriorates with aging. Aged people suffer mostly from tendency to fall asleep during the different times of the day and difficulties to maintain sleep at night. So what we did, we recruited, it's funny to say, elderly people. I could be recruited to that group too. <laughs> at that time, and uh, we used the 713 paradigm with young adults and with elderly, and indeed we found differences that uh, could be predicted based on the known pathologies of elderly sleep. Elderly had a much less pronounced pattern, these are the young adults, patterns of sleepiness, the significant differences were at the time of maximum sleep, and the time of what we call the forbidden zone for sleep, and after waking up, uh, uh, for after sleep deprivation, and it suggests that the amplitude of the cycle in elderly 
is crushed somehow, results that were confirmed by others in different studies. We are all aware that uh, we can roughly divide the population into morning people and evening people. Uh, morning people wake up like larks, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. By 11, they finish their uh, commitments for the day and go to sleep very early. The owls, the night people, they cannot wake up before 10, 11, and they go to sleep at uh, 3, 4. So we use questionnaire to define morning and evening people, and we try to see how the gate and the forbidden zone will be affected. And indeed, what we found out, there are major differences. After a night of sleep deprivation, this is the pattern of the morning, this is the pattern of the evening. When you subtract them, you find that evening people spend more time during the day asleep, morning people spend more time during the night asleep. Again, suggesting that the entire phenomena moved uh, in evening people. And it's interesting that uh, when you compare the gate of morning people, it was 10 o'clock, and the siesta zone, or the mid-afternoon peak, was at 3 o'clock. And uh, in evening people, it was at 1 a.m., and the siesta zone was at 5.30. So these uh, differences were dictated by a different pattern of melatonin secretion that in evening and morning people start to increase at different times of the day. And here come uh, the collaboration with Danny. One of the questions that we asked ourselves, how these changes in sleep propensity interact with performance? And one of the studies, which was a heroic study, we did a 28 hours sleep deprivation, 24 plus 4. And then we tested them for 36 hours, and they were performing a reaction time and movement time task. This is the device, Danny, you remember? You have to put the two fingers here. And then there was an indicator here that show you where to, you have to go. And we measure two things. We measure response time, releasing the key, and movement time from the key to the targets. And we have three different levels of difficulty. And we wanted to see how this will correlate with sleepiness or sleep propensity. We had eight subjects under two different conditions, attempting sleep, resisting sleep. And uh, these are the uh, performance data collapsed in six hours blocks. And it's very interesting. There was not a single difference in the amount of sleep in the attempting and resisting sleep. When you are after 28 hours of sleep deprivation and you are in bed, you cannot resist sleep. Sleep overpower you. But it's very interesting that the performance was affected by the experimental demand to remain awake. And toward the end of the study, performance deteriorated more in the resisting sleep than in the attempting sleep condition, suggesting that the effort that is made by the subject in order to keep them awake, over, even though they failed, somehow it compete with the same effort of the response to the indicator. This was published, I think, in Psychophysiology, and uh, so far was highly cited. So the conclusion of that, yeah, this was psychophysiology. Uh, there were no significant differences in total sleep between the conditions of attempting and resisting sleep. However, subjects instructed to resist sleep had slower reaction times, again suggesting competing on the same source of uh, uh, effort. Another question that Danny and myself uh, studied since we showed that melatonin can change the gate, the Air Force came to us and say, can we use melatonin to induce sleep during the day in pilots that have to do a night duty? We said yes, and they said, OK, what will be the price in performance? So we did a study in which we uh, uh, first studied to show that indeed melatonin can change the gate. And this was a very complicated study. 
again part of Ona Tsishinsky uh, PhD, five weeks, 713 paradigm, melatonin was given at mi midday, 12 o'clock, on the second day it was given at five o'clock, on the third day it was given uh, uh, around seven, 19, and then it was given at nine o'clock, the rest were placebo. So each subject participated five times in the 713 paradigm. These were brave students. And what you can see is indeed melatonin changed the gate. This is the pattern under placebo. Here is where melatonin was given at seven o'clock. You see how it closed the forbidden zone for sleep. Eliminated it. Here is when melatonin was given at uh, seven o'clock. And you can see that it advanced the gate as could be predicted because melatonin is indeed opening the sleep gate. It enhanced the mid-afternoon peak when it was given at 12, and this is again very similar to this one when it was given at five o'clock. So indeed, melatonin can help somebody to fall asleep during the day when he is preparing for a night shift. And here we did a study in order to look for uh, performance effects, and I must tell you the Air Force said, you are not going to study students. We're going to send you pilots. And they sent 16 reserve pilots to Goodfield Building. And we studied them in the laboratory and trying to see whether giving melatonin during the day at these different times will affect performance later on. I must tell you that uh, this was, again, a very complicated study. Each of the pilots came four times. First, we induced sleep for two hours between four and seven, between five and seven, under placebo, under melatonin. Then we say, suppose there is emergency, and you cannot complete the two hours. Let's see what happened with one hour. And when we tested them on a simulating flight performance, there was very little effect on performance. There was a major effect on sleep. So we could uh, uh, go back to uh, the Air Force and tell them it's safe to use melatonin to induce daytime sleep. It minimally interferes with performance. Just to show you that this pattern has uh, some impact in real life. I cannot show you the uh, results of this study. This is a study done in 86 in the Army. It's called the Acrobat Lip in which we tested the effect of 72 hours of sleep deprivation on performance of two tank platoons. This was the most expensive studied study I did in my life. Uh, the budget just for the uh, tanks was in the millions. <laughs> the purpose of the study was to test the effect of amphetamine on performance, but what we did throughout the study, we followed unplanned sleep episodes using the actigraphs. Actigraph is a device on the hand that can measure sleep and wake by movements. This was the first time we used an actigraph. We bought them from the US. And this is the uh, distribution across 64 soldiers of unintended sleep during the 78 hours. We went up to 78 hours. And you can see there was an initial peak at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, then at 2 o'clock, then at 4 o'clock. But look what happened here at the anticipated times of the forbidden zone. Subjects didn't have intended sleep. So even in prolonged sleep deprivation, almost four days, the sleepiness pattern with the mid-afternoon peak and the gate at night continued. Then we went to see whether it affected performance. This is data that we retrieved from uh, the files of the police. All the falling asleep accidents during a five-year period, 448. And this is distribution of time of the day and day of the week. And what you can see is the primary gate, 4 o'clock in the morning. By the way, it's Saturday and we identify it to be associated with soldiers who come back for a weekend. Most of them take the family car and make uh, an accident on the way back home from the pub, etc., etc. 
two hours accounted for about 70% of these accidents. And then there is a secondary peak at two to three in the afternoon. So indeed, <coughs> even without being aware of it, the pattern of sleepiness affect our behavior. Now let me, I have uh, 10 minutes, right? Let me go to the second uh, 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 subject of research that uh, we uh, focused on it in recent years, and I'm glad that uh, there is a continued research in this uh, area in the faculty right now. REM sleep is characterized by movements of the eyes back and forth, usually on the horizontal plane. This was the discovery of Kleitman, published in Science in 1963 and opened the way for modern sleep research. But in fact, the most characteristic aspect of REM sleep is change in the balance of the autonomic nervous system. During sleep, there is a parasympathetic dominance. When you move to REM sleep, there is a shift and suddenly there is a surge of sympathetic activation. So if you measure blood pressure, respiration, heart rate, all of them, when the eyes start to move, and these are the black bars here, show variability and increase. So during sleep, we have four to five windows during which we have sympathetic discharge. And nobody knows why. When you do uh, cerebral blood flow and you measure blood flow during the transition from wake to sleep and from all the stages of sleep to REM sleep, you see a huge increase in the amount of blood in the brain during dreaming sleep. This suggests that blood in the periphery is in fact rerouted into the brain. We were looking at that time for a simple measure to follow the sympathetic activation during dreaming sleep. And we decided to use the finger, the credit should go to Dr. Bob Schnell, who was a postdoc in my laboratory at that time, an outstanding physiologist. And we were looking to measure from the finger changes in the amount of blood that maybe can provide us a simple indicator of dreaming sleep. Why the finger? High density of nerve endings, very sensitive to autonomic nervous system, highest range of blood flow, can change in a ratio of 1 to 100, uh, has a thermoregulatory role, and very convenient, of course. So what Bob devised was uh, a probe that applied to the finger a pressure, subdiastolic, less than the diastolic pressure, that released the tension from the blood vessels inside the finger and moved them on the pressure to volume curve to the very sensitive part of the curve. Lo and behold, this was found to be one of the most sensitive indicators of arousal changes in the brain. This is an EEG, when you record from the scalp, these are called K-complex. K-complex is a micro-arousal lasting no more than 100 millisecond, 200 millisecond. Very brief. These are recording from the finger, and look what happened to the blood flow in the finger. This is the amount of blood immediately after the microarousal in the brain. Each time there is a microarousal in the brain, the finger immediately responds. When we correlate the changes in alpha, which is the brainwave indicating waking during sleep, with the amplitude or the amount of blood in the finger, you can see the phase locking between the two phenomena. More than that, when you compare, for instance, Subject went to sleep with earphones and we sounded clicks, 50 dB clicks. Immediately, the brain responds with K event and alpha, and the finger responds. The maximum change in heart rate was about five seconds after the click. The maximum change in the amplitude, in the amount of blood in the finger was about seven. But the magnitude of the change was immensely different. The change in blood in uh, heart rate was about 8%. So there is an increase in heart rate of 8%. The change in blood in the finger is 
So the finger is squeezed out of blood once you hear the click during sleep. Now, this is the cross correlation between the two phenomena, and this is the seven seconds delay after sounding the click. So what we found is probably the best indicator of sympathetic activation, <coughs> equal stress, that was reported in the literature up to that point. Now, what we did, we studied it throughout sleep. This is our nature paper that demonstrate that during dreaming sleep, indeed, there is activation of sympathetic nervous system with decrease in blood flow in the fingers, which explain why the brain get so much blood. So you can see from the sleep onset, falling asleep, there is a decrease, a gradual decrease in the amplitude of the signal from the finger reaching an adir during the first REM period, then open again, reaching another nadir during the second REM period. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, I'll run fast. We show that this is correlated with the density of eye movement during dreaming sleep, and we also showed fractal correlation. There is a poster I saw outside, uh, uh, and this led to a new medical device that detects sleep from the finger, and uh, it is now in commercial use. And now it brings me one of the fascinating experiments we ever done. When I spoke with Danny about it, he said, wow, let's see, during flight, how pilots respond to stress. So this is the uh, flight simulator in Schiphol Airport, and uh, this is uh, a finger probe. The uh, pilot was flying, and we could document how much blood in the finger in different parts of the task. So this is landing, a decrease of about almost 40% of blood in the finger compared to cruising, which was very little stress. It can also show us that pilot not flying had more inhibition of blood in the finger than pilots who were flying, the control issue. It also showed us what happened under emergency condition. The, during the flight, you hear the sound, you hear the blink, you see the blinking, and this is what happened. The event, 10 seconds later, 20 seconds later, 30 seconds later, this is the first officer, this is the captain, these are all the pilots. So, this device later helped us to understand the effect of memory loading on stress and performance. Christine Ayani, who did the study, and uh, another study we did with the uh, flight uh, simulator in, uh, of Professor Grunwald, which also showed us how pilots uh, uh, respond to different difficulties. Well, <laughs> this is the last slide. Just to show you that we also had very fun times. This is taken from the pooling party. I'm not so sure who is Danny, but he's behind one of these masks. So Danny, these were good times. I'm sure you'll continue, you and Mira, continue to give and to contribute to the Technion. And uh, I will say only this, whenever I give talks in such events, it reminds me Chinese food. Why Chinese food? Sweet and sour. <laughs> Sweet, because now you can do whatever you want. I cannot force you to participate in any committee. And sour, it's an end of a period. Thank you very much.